sitting here recruiting you and I say, Matt, it's simple, man. you got four things that you got to take care of in this program. And, and if you take care of those four things, Matt, then you're going to come to me and you're never going to say, why am I playing more? Because I'm going to say, Matt, you killed it. You can guard the ball. You can rebound the ball. You can move it and defend it. And then now you're in great shape. You should never complain about playing time. And you, should have, and you can only see that I'm empowering you to control your faith. Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders so let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. Today we are joined by the head men's basketball coach at Texas Wesleyan University, Brennan Shingleton. Coach Shingleton just completed his 12th season as head coach and has 204 wins. He reached the 100 win mark faster than any coach in school history. In his 21 seasons at Texas Wesleyan, Coach Singleton has been part of seven conference championships and two national championships. He's been named the Sooner Athletic Conference Coach of the Year twice in the past four seasons. During the 2016-17 season, Coach Singleton led Texas Wesleyan to their second NAIA Division I National Championship and was named NAIA National Coach of the Year. Before we hear from Coach, take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media at Jamoti Podcast. What's you up, there? Coach? How you doing, man? Oh, man, doing great. It's good to see you. Great to see you. You been okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah, living the dream here at Faith. But, man, I got to say, I love the background that yeah, you I have. Got, is that is that all right right there? Oh, yeah, it looks That's great. Better. And it, that, that uh, the outlaw, the Texas State with the outline, the Nike check, that, that's super cool. Yeah, and those guys, uh, they are, all of our former players come in and sign it when they come back, so – pretty sweet i love that that's a great idea i, I mean yeah let well, me steal that coach we've been on we... for less than a minute and i've already i've already stolen something from you that's <laughs> it <laughs> well, listen i i mean it's a cool deal we we we're fortunate to bounce off the success of some of those teams that we had in the past and um and so we were able to redo the locker room when we did it we were trying to figure out a unique way to make it ours you yeah because everybody's fighting the same problem you know that's trying to do something new to catch a kid's eye. And these, uh, these guys all want something, you know, It's so it's neat to have them back. We had one back. We had a kid come back this afternoon, actually. One of his students uh, that he coaches down in Waco at Waco High is up here taking a tour and all that stuff. So he came with them. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Well, man, yeah. th thank you so much for for coming on and doing this. And this is Not an honor problem. honor for me because I, I want. It's always fun when I actually have a personal relationship with with the coach. And and yeah. so I've no, I've known you for a few years. Had the pleasure of uh, listening to you at some coaches' clinics and then working some camps at your gym. So yeah. again, yeah. Uh, really appreciate this, man. Not a problem. I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, I don't bring it down. <laughs> I do. I do. You would I feel saw that you way. I on here last week. He's such a good dude, too, man. Golly. Make Super sure sharp. That's for sure. He is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, how'd that go with you, your teams this year? We split. We beat them. Uh, we beat them here, and then they beat us there. And they got better as the year going on. I, I really thought they were the best team out of our league coming at the end. Hmm. And they just kind of like most of us just kind of fought human nature all year long. These kids are different nowadays, you know, Make what do you tough. mean? Yeah. What do you mean by that? I really think COVID played a really difficult, um, especially in this age group played a really difficult uh, hand to them socially. Yeah. You know, I think it put them on their heels on how they were going to react to adversity. Mm -hmm. And then the other side too, I think it just mentally to mentally warmed down. And especially in this age group, I know you deal with just kind of the 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 start of this age group, but we were dealing with kind of the tail end of it and the fear of the unknown when it got taken away and then putting them back in and then the adversity of it. And then mom and dad dealing with occupational issues or it could be relationship issues. And then, you know, you always dealt with that as a college coach. Right. But then when it became real, where everything was costing more jobs were on the line. Families were broken apart and grandparents were getting sick. And, and then when it, when we got released from all of that, and then we started to kind of get on, oh, then the other side was the vaccination, right? I mean, we were all dealing with the vaccination issues. Should we, shouldn't we? Socially, do you do it? That, and then you dealt with the social injustices of all that stuff. And so 
man, we, it, it was a lot for a couple yeah. of years, you know? And the one thing that always brought us together was the love of basketball, right? And the love of community and the love of being a team. And it became harder and harder. And then, and then you just deal with real life issues. Uh, everything's costing more. It's hard to commute nowadays. Gas is more, you know, how much can I take out to take a loan out? Or am I just going to transfer and go to a school that allow me to get more, but it might not be what I want. And so it's like all those things were real conversations, Matt. It was crazy. I, it, and it still is. I mean, we're still dealing with that on a day to day basis. So what a great reminder. I mean, because I think sometimes. You can almost fool yourself into thinking things are back. Things are right. normal again. Besides the fact that, like, you, you go by the gas station and you see yeah. <laughs> you see how much that right. is. But but it is a great reminder uh, that uh, we were fortunate, you and I, to go through that whole uh, time, that COVID time as adults. Right. You know, where I, even, but I mean, if golly, if we felt it, you know, you see something, especially when it first started and we're all locked down and you see something on the news and you're wondering, will life be the same again? Right. And, you know, and, and then, but golly, think about that as a junior high, high school or college kid where you don't have the 40 to 50 years of life experience to, to kind right. of deep down know, all right, first of all, we know who's in control, but then also life tip, typically tends to cycle, yeah. circle back around. They didn't know that. And so yeah. great, great reminder, man. And, and not to get on the other side of that too, but it tests your faith a little bit. And these yeah. young guys, I mean, we have faith because we have experience and we have faith because we see these little flip side of it. These guys have faith on a word. Or they might have faith on an action that somebody else has had, but it doesn't really hit their house, you know? Yeah. And then when this all came about and, and everybody started lifting restrictions and everybody started kind of getting back to it, then they started thinking, well, it's really not normal. I mean, what we had wasn't isn't the same anymore, you know? And so now the reality is, can I afford school? What is the cost of education versus the reward of going to school? Wow. You know, can I do this? Can I do that? The 800 kids in the transfer portal as of noon today. And it's just all that stuff. And so it's just made it tough, man. It, it, you know, these guys, as much as we want to help them, we also have to keep them uh, honored and disciplined as well, because then we're not really helping them if we just skate and pretend it doesn't exist. So it's been a rough couple of years for us, and especially in my program in particular, because the expectations are to win. You know, the expectations are to compete and the expectations of this university are to, to have great young men that are coming in here and doing the right things and, and saying and acting the right way. And, and when those things don't all add up, man, it, it, our expectations don't change just because you're here. They've always been here. We're going to honor everybody behind us and, and the guys that have invested in us. And my assistants have always been around here and help Coach Waldrop that was here before me. So we're going to do all of that regardless of what happens in the outside world. We've got to hold ourselves accountable, too. So it's been it's been interesting, to say the least. So, yeah, I really I really do appreciate you sharing that. And also, I've always um, had a, had an appreciation for college coaches and, and especially those like you that have been at the same school for such a long time. I mean, what is it, 21 years? This was a 21st season. Yep. Yeah, yeah, in, in different capacities, but at the same school. So you've, yeah, you know, grind is a word that people throw around, but you've kind, of, you've really been through the grind at that place, yeah. and then, and you've had some major success, and and then to to kind of hear and, and know that that the struggle it, it is tough for our athletes, but then on top of everything they're going through, you still have to win and put a team together that's going to be successful. Yeah. Like golly, what a what a tough task that is. Well, it's really, listen, that's why we coach, right? Nobody wants to coach to, to participate, at least in my mind. I don't know anybody that does. Yeah. I mean, they might, there might be guys that say they want to win, but don't really would do the work. And, and winning is hard, and, and it's getting harder. And, we, and being consistent might be even harder than winning. You know, and, uh, and so we look at it like, I mean, our league is getting better daily, right? I mean, when, when Clint got into the league, better you know you got Langston now that's just loaded to the gills and he does a great job right and so you got the traditional powers and the NAI is changing and all this other stuff and and I'm gonna tell you who doesn't care our opponents don't care that we're struggling <laughs> I mean they like the fact that we're sitting here going dang 
you know, Shingleton and Texas Westlands had another mediocre year, and I'm sitting there going, oh, my God. Uh-huh. What do we do, you know? And, and the thing is, is that I'm not compromising. I want good kids. Yeah. I want guys that want to be here. I want guys that value what we, we what this school and this program offers. I'm not going to go win at all costs. I never have, never will. And so we're going to try to figure this thing out. But like, like you said, it's just getting, you know, winning hard. And, and the standard that's been set with me and before me is not going to change just because we struggle a little bit. It's we're just going to work a little harder and get the right guys. And we will. So you've mentioned the portal a couple of times, man, 800 bodies in there. And as a high school coach, you know, I, 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 you hear about it and you obviously see with the NCAA tournament, uh, just how, how many older players there are out there and just how many people are moving. I mean, I, I, it, it was almost laughable when the announcers are talking about these players and yeah, last year he was here and last year he was here. And, you know, in your opinion, is it, is that what you're you're relying on, or no, do you still I, find I, the high school kids? Man, I I know this is a, a family podcast, but it's it's like serial dating. I mean, it, it, like I was never that guy, right? I mean, yeah. I'm so fortunate that my wife, I say, chose me, and 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 you know, and and I look at it like somebody asked me how long I've been married, and I'm like, not long enough. Uh, you Love know that that, that is. Like, I, I don't work well with that. I'm a relationship guy. I understand that it's vital to get get winning and get playing well early and quick. But I will tell you that the, it's getting harder and harder because the kids don't look at it that way. Like, they think, oh, I'm a transfer. I'm ready. Man, do you realize how hard it is uh, every day to come in here? There's a reason why you transfer. And all those reasons are, are theirs and their own, and I respect that. But – Listen, when there's 800 kids out there transferring, and let's say there's 600 seats at the table, somebody's going to miss on something. And these kids, it's so quick to leave. It's so quick to go to the easiest way out. When we want to look at it like, hey, man, stick around, do the right thing. Let's get through this together because you got coaching staff and a program that will support you. And we don't have many kids leave. I mean, we had one kid leave this year, and we, we kind of mutually agreed to it. We had seven seniors. We'll graduate in May. Awesome. We two kids. Yeah, we had two kids in graduate school, and then theoretically, our best player uh, was hurt uh, prior to the season, and so he was out the entire year. So we were a little off all year, but we had we got what we deserved. We just missed a couple of things, but this portal is going to make things coaches lose sleep at night because not only I mean you look up at I and I and I'm saying this because I know that it's been quoted online, but you look at Grant McCaslin at North Texas. They're saying, I'm hearing people are trying to poach his players right now, and they're still playing. Wow. I mean, they're still playing, right? I mean, you know Grant. And so you're saying, you know, man, as good a coach as he is, you, no one would ever touch his tech players. And I've seen it on paper, not that it's true or not, but if you've got to think there's major Division One coaches right now trying to get his players out of it. I mean, just how is that a world to coach in? And yeah. I, I don't understand it because the only thing that I've ever known is, you get the most out of your players when they're willing to play for something more than themselves, whether that's a relationship, whether that's the school or the teammates that they love. And when they always feel like there's an outside distraction or somebody trying to promise them something that they can't own up to, I think that's really difficult, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. That man. quick fix thing, man, is tough. I, I prefer food in the oven. Let's take a little time. Let's not cook it in the microwave. It's microwave. You get home, you want to eat, you want to go to bed. Put it in the oven. Let's cook it for a minute, man. Let this let the ingredients simmer and work together. And and I don't, man, I don't think that portal works like that anymore. So being at, at in the college game for so long, and I imagine that you're uh and, and fr- also knowing you, Matt, I know that you are constantly trying to learn and grow and, and and learn new things. What's one quality that you see in great leaders that you admire? I'll tell you, it, it, as this goes on, it, the cliche we answer was always like confidence and, and accountability and all this sort of stuff. But I think the best leaders right now are humble. You know, that they're willing to learn and that they're willing to listen and that they're willing to put somebody's needs in front of their own. And that humility is few and far between nowadays, in my opinion. You know, and, I, and maybe it's because we've struggled or not lived up to the standard in which we we want to be at every year and we should be at. But humility is something that I think leaders in every facet of our lives right now, not to get political on you, not to get religious <laughs> on you, but 
Not, I think there's a sense of humility that we all have to have in order to make people really better around us. And that's really what the goal of leadership should be, right? I mean, it's not to tell people what you know. Yeah. It's more what you can get people to do around you and, and feel confident and, and have that stuff that they want to be around you. I mean, this is a team game, right? And so we're not playing golf. I mean, so it's like, hey, come on. If, if I can take a step back to get the most out of somebody else, then maybe we can all do that and get to the same direction together rather than individually. And so to me, humility is one thing that when I read that question, I started thinking, well, he's probably heard, you know, confidence, commitment, this, that, all this stuff. But I, I really do. Uh, I, I really and I work on that all the time because, you know, as a head coach, you have to be confident. You have to be forthright. You've got to be able to stand in a room and do that. But to be humble, man, when things go wrong and admit fault and, and humble enough to allow somebody else to get the praise, uh, I think that's a powerful deal, man. And, and and I wish we all could be. I mean, you're probably like that. You know, Coach Matt, Coach G's the, the most humble guy you meet. And uh, the guys like that are uh, that have that have a unique quality to make people around them better. And I know I need to work on it. And I only hope that we can all be a little bit more humble. And, uh, and and get to where we want to go with it. Well, no, to your last point, yeah, I think we all can. We can always use more humility. But I mean, the fact that you're aware of that, like that, that is something that lead that great leaders have. You probably possess that, you know. And um, I was thinking a little bit of a question of you being 21 years into this. Is that something that you have always had, uh, or, or or have always admired or thought about, or early on in your coaching career? Were you because uh, Robert Morris at at Gateway Church? Um, I just this always he was talking about pride, and he said pride wants to talk. Pride wants to talk. So if you're talking a ton, and that maybe that's my problem yeah, right no. now, you know. But like if you're talking a ton, that's pride. Humble, listen. So go ahead. Yeah, Matt. And that, but the hard part about it is what happens when your leadership is quiet. Somebody's got to say something, right? Like we just can't assume. And so I struggled with that all year because we had a very like talkative team, but without any substance. Mm. And so when I say humility, it's almost like um, we have, I, I work on humility all the time in ways in which I can be humble. I can't be quiet. I can't be, I can't be a uh, lack of energy. I can't be, con I, I, if I lack confidence, my team will lack confidence. If I lack energy and, and drive, then my team's going to lack that too. I think the humility side comes from not making it about me, but making it about others. Yeah. yeah. Not being that guy that speaks first rather than listens first and then responds. It's that kind of humility, I think, that I search for. And I know that I work on and I have to pay attention to, even in my personal life. I mean, obviously, we're both married. We both got kids. It's kind of like it'd be really easy to sit there and go, Dad, I'm the dad. I'm the husband. I'm the head coach. I'm this, I'm that. And you get nothing out of it other than just getting yourself wound up, you know. And so I'm finding myself learning that every day is that, man, you just said it. Listen first. But as a head coach, you've got to be confident. I mean, we we pitch this program every day. We sell it, whether it's to people donating money to your locker room, to future basketball players, to the confidence in which you have to portray your team to others, the other programs in the university. So it's it, it, you, we, it's such a fine line to be confident yet humble, but not egotistical, but also pretty prideful in your situation as well. I and mean, man, it, it's a balancing act, and you can't really perfect it. I mean, there's certain coaches that that obviously do, um, and I guess I'm striving to be that. So yeah, you nailed it though. It's it's the you, we do have to talk as head coaches. I love that term of you're pitching your program every day. Like that's uh, that's great right there. Um, but we have when you are making it about your team or more than yourself and you're in front of your team owning a mistake or owning an area or deficiency away a place where you can get better what do you see that do for your team as far as the culture the atmosphere when the coach himself is owning his mistakes well Matt, I'm gonna I'm gonna be real personal with you here we we had I know it's a basketball ideal podcast but yeah we uh, go everywhere though man we'll go everywhere well we had some tragedies within our program this year uh, my assistant came down with with terminal cancer. 
We had a uh, player of ours in a, a fatal car accident. His his best friend was actually killed in the car accident. And then I, me personally had some personal stuff off the court that happened to me uh, that really devastated our family. So we had multiple things happen this year that kind of rocked our, our program. Uh, I will tell you that uh, we saw – a side, I, me personally, I showed them a side of me that I'm not sure that I've shown any other team. I probably cried more this year in front of my team uh, more than than ever. And I'm not sure that that was good or bad. I just know it was real. Uh, and then the humility side of knowing that probably failed a couple of times that we should have won or we didn't make the right decisions because we allowed our personal lives to, to reflect or to – to trickle into our basketball program. So we didn't have great practices or we weren't fully engaged. Those are, those are things that happened to us this year that I will never take back because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, winning is great, but I will promise you that I think that the guys that got it and felt that moment realized that it was okay to be emotional. It was okay to cry. It was okay to, to be sad and angry. And then hopefully they're going to realize it's not easy being a father. It's not easy being a husband. It's not easy running a program. It's not easy being an employee. And you still got to go to work and you still got to do all those things. And so when we look at those situations, I mean, if that was the best learning tool that we had this year, we won. Yeah. We won because God gave us those things happened to us for a reason. And I, I don't believe in accidents. Uh, I believe in reasons. And so those, it happened to us for a reason. It made us stronger. It made me stronger. It made me a better coach of appreciation. But it also made me super humble because I just thought I could show up and coach. I just thought I could show up and tough it out. I just thought if I yelled a little louder or worked a little harder or came with more energy, it was going to work out. And it did just the opposite. It, it just it stopped us in our tracks. And so every time life dealt us something this year, we got together and we tried to figure it out, but we were also, you know, very uh, humble. Uh, we shared experiences. And I think it showed our guys, too, that, geez, uh, this guy that looks like he walks around angry all the time, I, I didn't think he was crying. I didn't think he was emotional when it came to certain things with his family and, and friends and, more importantly, my assistant. You know, when you find that out, somebody you've coached, that you work with every day, and then he's got a – a young daughter and a wife, and you're sitting there going, he's just starting his life, you know, and here I am complaining, we don't practice hard enough, or here I am complaining, we don't take enough charges. <laughs> and then you got that reality of life right there. And so that was, that was a monumental shift in my coaching career this year. It was, uh, it was something that I've never done. I never really showed that side of myself, uh, because I wanted this to be a, a part of progress for them and not necessarily me, but I found myself really growing up this year as a coach. Man, thank so, you for, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Like that's super, yeah. super impactful and a great, uh, great reminder for all, all of us to, uh, I don't think our players expect us to be superhuman. Right. And, and expect us to never, but I feel like sometimes we put that on ourselves I, I want my players to show up every day with spirit and energy with a smile on our face. So no matter what's going on in my life, I have to bring that too. Right. And that's, that's tough. And so you, you opened up and let them in. Let me ask you this. Is that something that from this point forward, you'll continue to do because you, you did it because of some of these big, big experiences and circumstances, right. but what if it's a season where things are relatively smooth? Yeah, I hope to be able to translate that. I think um, if you know me at all, I'm not very hokey. Like, I don't want to coach to coach. I don't want to play coach. I don't want to do things that don't reflect positive or progress within our program. So I will, I will always know that I have that in me to do now. I just don't know that I will use it other than – when it's necessary. No, you know? no. And I don't mean at all like, hey, you right. use that as a, just another tool, but sure. just the ability to go there, not like if something happened, because I felt that yeah. before this this year with my uh, full transparency with my, with my younger son who, who lives far away. We had a, a difficult conversation that as a dad and a son, he's he's, uh, you know, 15. Right. It was just it was tough. And I had to I had to go right to practice after, and I let the guys know that I just, guys, I listen, I, I spirit and joy or something I try to bring every day. I'm just not feeling it. 
And right. so I feel like when, like my question is more like when those moments do come up, uh, the, the tendency for me is to, I bet guys that can't have a bad day are the head coach and the best player. Yeah. Right. And, but what if we do, do we allow our players into that world? And it seems like you did this year and yeah, I we did. Yeah. Yeah, we did. And it, and it, uh, and I think in long run, maybe not now, as we all know, college guys don't ever really get it till after they're gone or years down the road. I just hope it, it translates to some of those kids that might not have the family background that I have, that they can look back and go, you know what? I remember that feeling and he got through it and I'll get through it. And, and you rely on your wife and you rely on your faith and you rely on your kids and you rely on your family and the people that know you the best to get you through those moments. And, and knowing that this is just a game man. this is a monumental period of our life. And this game has brought us together. Uh, but at the end of the day, that your core characteristics is what you learn through these times are really what's going to allow you to stay afloat in the long run. And again, it just gets back to that whole conversation we started with. Man. This, this last few years has really been trying for a lot of us. And, and so hopefully these things that have pre pre been presented to us only make us stronger. And I think it will. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is powered by Bology. Manage and measure your player's skill development and increase accountability year-round utilizing the Bology app. Boost inter-squad competition with drills backed by the National High School Basketball Coaches Association, including a 40-shot Bology skills assessment. Please visit Bology.com slash teams for information on how you can provide this resource for your team. Uh, along those lines of how challenging the, the last few years have been with obviously that what's go been going on in the world, but then yeah. too with things like transfer portal and, and this microwave society has really come into the sports world more than ever before. Yeah. Culture does seem to be uh, at that buzzword, but the standards, what right. your program stands for, um, how you show up is really important. If you want to keep these players, it's not, it's impossible to always keep them happy, but keep them, in your program and for them to feel the value, what are some of the standards and pillars of your program? So uh, I, I have a lot of key terms when it comes to basketball side, uh, we've got four. Um, we keep it really simple, but on the life side, which, you know, we tend to gravitate and talk more about because I think that's ultimately more important, unbelievably, but um I, I will not bring a kid into my program that can't be around my kids, my own kids, without me around. Mm -hmm. So when it's a game day and my kids are hanging out in my office or they're running the hallways or my son's sitting in the locker room, if they're not smart enough or savvy enough or have enough character to know their language matters, their way they represent, those are things that, that it's not a, you know, God, we all wish we were John Wooden and had a beautiful triangle and this thing that was mapped out as clear as day, right? It's not that it's it is Brian knows my assistants know my former players know that if I can't bring my kids around here or if I've got to go home to my wife and apologize, then you ain't going to be around here long. And how do I define that real easily? If I want to be around you, then it works, you know, <laughs> and if you don't want to be around me, you don't want to hear about all those hokey stuff about being a dad and loving on my kids and all that stuff, then it won't work. And so we just look for integrity. Uh, we look for guys that want to be better when they leave here. We look for guys that need help. I need help. I need you to help me. You know, I'm on this thing to hopefully take something from you and go home and go, God, man, I'm, I'm feeling good now. I can go home and, and, and be better feeling for this. And so it's that simple for us when it comes to the basketball side of it, the integrity, the want to. We want guys that want to be here, not feel like they have to be here, not feel like they just – think this place is going to pole vault them to somewhere else that they want to be here. They want to unpack their bags and want this place to help them and they can help and put their fingerprint, put their name on the wall here. Uh, and then the basketball side of things is simple. Uh, we transition to the basketball side of things. I, I empower my guys to do four things. And if they can't do those four things, I don't want them coming to my office saying, Hey, why am I not playing this, that they got to be able to rebound the ball. If they can't rebound the ball, and I'm talking about like go get it out of your area. Not yeah, it just uh, it falls in your hands. I did it. No, like show some effort, right? Like I want, I want the ball, right? Give the yeah. rebound ball, okay? And then you got to be able to pass the ball. 
Meaning like not just me and you thumbs down, clicking it. I'm talking about, do you make the right pass? Are you unselfish enough to know that kid's hit two in a row? I'm going to find him and get another one. That, that, that It might sound cliche, but you understand the depth in which we're talking about. Can you pass the ball? On the time first, and on target, man. Like yeah, that, on that time is, and on target, yeah. exactly. And do you make college passes? Or do you make these, these 2K passes, these passes that never work? That, that's all encompassed. You see, I'm making it so simple that you and I roll our eyes. But when I talk to a recruit, they're like, you know, they're pausing. Yeah. They're like, uh, Coach, you, you got like 50 definitions of a pass. I said, man, listen, it's not easy to come in here and say, I do these things. You've got to be good at it, right? I mean, passing the ball to the other team does not count. That's you know, right. passing it to your teammates, right? And getting guys open, right? Passing it to a seven-footer down on his ankles does not count. You know, you've got to, you got to be able to pass the ball. The third thing is defending the ball. Like, do you have enough pride to know that your guy cannot score? That's not that's not fouling. That's not pressure in his shorts. That's not, you know, pretending to keep somebody in front of you. That's none of that. Like, do you have the discipline to guard the basketball? That means a pass away, two passes away, in a good stance, every possession, not every once in a while. Can you guard without fouling? Can you guard without enticing other teams to have to help you? All that stuff. So those, those three things. And then the fourth one is, are you in good shape? Does your body language tell me that you can play more? Are you tough enough mentally to know that you've got one extra possession, two extra possessions? Do you, do you look at your teammates when they're talking to you in the game? See, all that stuff to me is defined as conditioning and great shit. Love so that. when I'm sitting here recruiting you and I say, Matt, it's simple, man. you got four things that you got to take care of in this program. And, and if you take care of those four things, Matt, then you're going to come to me and you're never going to say, why am I playing more? Because I'm going to say, Matt, you killed it. You can guard the ball. You can rebound the ball. You can move it and defend it. And then now you're in great shape. You should never complain about playing time. And you, should have met, and you can only see that I'm empowering you to control your fate. I'm not sitting here saying, well, Brian recruited you, so you're his guy. No, I coach you. You're my guy. You're 6'11". You're 6'3". Because it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how tall you are. If you can control those four things, you realize how hard it would be for me to take you out of the game. Like, I'm, I'm trying to win, brother. I'm not trying to win a popularity contest. I'm not trying to win video, you know, streaming contests and who gets the most clicks. I don't care about any of that. I'm terrible at that stuff. Matt Garnett used to get on me all the time. He goes, you got to self-promote better. And I'm like, look at me. I got a face for radio, man. Nobody wants to. I'm not trying to self-promote anything. Nobody, look I'm at me. My, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky my wife wants to see me, let alone all this other stuff. So it, you can only imagine. So I tell a kid that, hey, you're coming from Texas, A&M, Corpus Christi, whatever. You come from there. All you got to do is four things. That's it. And so we talk about that on the recruiting pitch. And then as time goes on, it, the depth of it, it gets bigger and bigger. And the, and the severity of it comes bigger and bigger. And the, re, the repercussions. But you know what, Matt? If they get it. They knew that they did it. It wasn't me. It wasn't we helped them, right? And so we told them it's that, it's that simple, man. It's that simple. Like you do those four things, you control your output. You control your production. It's not about me anymore. So coach isn't, as we used to say, the term screwing us or getting yeah. over on us. It's no, you, you, you don't guard because your man goes by you. You foul too much. You don't take care of the ball. You turn it over. Statistically, it's right there. You can't blame somebody else. You don't rebound because every time a shot, half the shots are missed. Yeah. And you get two a game at playing at 20 minutes a game, 25 minutes a game. So that's on you. And then, of course, every time I see you, you're grabbing your shorts, your body language is bad, your, your head's down. That's conditioning. You jog back in transition. You jog back in offense. You know, it, it's it's conditioning. So we look at it like I, I, I'm, I'm giving all my tools away here, but we, we look at it like, man, I'm just a completely empowering you and your, your outcome becomes yours, not mine. It, it absolutely becomes yours. So those are our real pillars when it comes to the basketball side of things. But on the, the personal side of things, I mean, we all know it's a day to day checklist on that. So, Coach, so much gold to unpack right there. The, the, the first part, like on the personal side. Um, when you were, when you're talking about like the fact that they, you want players that you can trust around your kids. Like to me, that, that that's a self-awareness thing. Like TJ Rosine said, self-awareness is a superpower. 
Like it's like after all these years of having so many players come in and out of the door, like you realize that that's really important to you. And I think just the the idea of that that is is huge. How many coaches don't really know? Like they only focus on the basketball side. Like I, I really, as long as he can score, I don't really care about anything else. But that idea of is this kid, like you said, smart enough, self aware right. enough to know who's in the room, what to say, what not to do. Uh, I love that pillar, man. Yeah. Well, it's it's hard because we all want to win. And none of us are perfect. I mean, my language can get terrible at times. And and I tell guys all the time, man, if there's a woman around and you don't and I don't recognize it, let me know. If there's something that we're talking about and, and it gets in your in my language gets too dicey, please let me know. I need to be aware of it because like we all we're a product of our environment. My dad was in the military for 35 years. You can only imagine how I was raised. And so and those are things that we all adapt and adjust to, but it's hard. I mean, because yeah. at the end of the day, not everybody's not everybody values those things. And so you might see a great student that's a great basketball player, but he comes from a tough environment. So please and thank you, don't work for him. He mm. might need to hear a more directive term, but at the end of the day, please and thank you is going to work for his employer. And so we have to understand that as coaches, we have to understand that not every kid is going to value me being a dad the way I value it because he probably didn't have that experience. But my job is to say, hey, this is the way this place operates. You came to us. We didn't, you didn't live down the street and get district here. You came to play for us. And so you have to understand this is who we are. This is who my assistants are. This is how we value this place. And so hopefully they understand that. And, and you'd be shocked at how it really is fun because then they become like guardians of my kids in a lot of ways. Like they enjoy seeing them. They ask where I'm at. I might tell a crazy story and they relate to it because they know the kid or they know the, that, you know, I always say, say my wife is very crazy, even though she's super smart, way beyond my skill level. But they always laugh at the fact that they think that I go home to this jungle gym of a house, you know, with four kids. So it's, it's, it really is a fun situation because I don't have any, listen, we're not getting, I'm not getting million dollar bonuses for winning games around here. So we don't have some sort of peace of mind and love and, and respect around here. There's, it's not much worth it. So on the other side with, with the basketball, I mean, you're, yeah, you're kind of selling yourself short a little bit with, uh, it is simple, those four things, but like you said about as far as empowering, how, how many times do players go into or coaches tell players, you know, I, you have to show me, you have to show me what you're made of or some kind of just vague phrase like that. And I'll, uh, and I'll put you in the game. Like, you know, force me to play you all of those things right. that you hear, right. but then the player really doesn't know what that means or what areas of the game that they have to improve on or that, right. that, that the coach is looking for. Uh, it's, it's the disconnect between player and coach, but those right. four things, man, it's pretty clear. And like you said, it may sound simple, but passing, oh my goodness. Uh, like it, 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 it's it, a nightmare. You it, get deep in nightmare. that. You get deep nobody, in that. It, nobody, I mean, it, it's as simple as Matt. If you and I are on the perimeter and I pass it to your inside hand, I, what are we doing? Again, this is college basketball. You, this is where you forget the pros. You're not going there. This is where you're supposed to be right now. And you don't have the discipline to pass it on the outside hand when the defender's right there. Like, you, you got to get it to his where he can catch it, not get it stolen. It's little things like that. And then I sit back and go, hey, we talked about passing. It might be my job to teach you as a 24-year-old senior, but, I mean, come on now. Let, 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 let's, let's call it what it is. You told me in, back in August you wanted to be a pro, and I'm having to teach you to pass it to the outside hand. We probably ought to need to take a step back here. Let, let's In your sixth forward. year of college basketball, if I have to, t- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you get discounts at restaurants now, pal. I mean, let's let's call it what it is. I mean, I get you get the discount at it's, it's Subway now for me. So yeah, it's uh, it is. It sounds simple and it's easy to talk about, but I'm gonna tell you that's kind of how I coach. Uh, I can't over complex things because I want to be good at the little stuff as far as we got to have something to hold on to rather than saying, oh, well, we do this and we do that. And then every day we try to reinvent ourselves because um, in my particular philosophy, 
is I've never really tried to outcoach anybody. I want to try to play this game that we do well better than you. Uh, and I don't know that it always works. Sometimes it probably bites us in the butt, but but I, I've never tried to – I mean, we all have to make adjustments, right, every game, every minute of every day. But uh, I think if we're really confident in what we do in this locker room, then we'll have a chance to compete at every level, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely buy into the idea of we need to focus on ourselves more than our opponents. Sure. It's not about them. It's about us and us doing things better. But obviously with adjustments being a little bit of the art art of it in the moment. Um, one right. thing I loved about your four things is that uh, scoring, shooting was not one of them. And so how does that fit in? So you got a player that maybe does those four things really well, but – Golly, we need you to we need you to contribute Matt, a little bit. How many clinics have you and I gone into? And the first thing, and I know you specialize in this, so I think this is great. <laughs> right? you, we're not going to debate anything you win. Uh, but but how many how many times have we walked into and a kid tells you that he can score, or a kid tells you that he can shoot it? And the stats don't lie, right? I mean, we know if a kid shoots over forty percent, he's got a pretty good clip. At three, if he shoots at fifty percent on the floor, he's taking good shots. He finishes at the rim. He understands shot selection, so we we know that. But the problem is, is that they know that too. And so then, then I can't debate those things anymore. Like those numbers come out in the wash because every kid can come to me and say, "I'm the leading scorer," but our team only won fourteen games last year. Dude, you're the leading scorer on a bad team. How many turnovers do you have? How many rebounds? How many extra possessions did you get? Like, uh, how many how many fouls did you average a game because you reached and didn't have any discipline? How many minutes did you play? And within those minutes, the quality of minutes did you play? Because I can see, okay, you played 27 minutes a game, which tells me that you're pretty good shape. But in those 27 minutes, you only got two rebounds a game. You averaged four turnovers. So I looked at that that four things for me, and I said, that worked for me because I know that I'm teaching effort. And not only am I teaching effort, but I'm rewarding you for doing the things that don't necessarily bounce off a coach's stat sheet, like three-point percent, scoring, things like that. Because those are the easy, those are the guarantees that I know that I can go to a kid and go, wow, he can really score. But what does he do in the minutes that I that, that I find important? Like, is his body language great? After a 7-0 run in a team, gives you give up a 7-0 run. Is your body language good? Are you conditioned to know that you're tough, that everybody's watching the best player when things go bad? That's conditioning to me. You know, that's not necessarily fast running. That's conditioning. That's mental toughness. That's putting yourself in a position to be resistant. And so, yeah, I think shooting's important. We can't go this game without scoring. But until I get to a level, I mean, even what I read today, do you realize that in the NCAA tournament right now, the overall three point percentage right now is 31%. Bad. 30%. Yeah. yeah. And everybody's blaming the basketball. Everybody's blaming this, blaming that. You know, we're shooting in arenas with backdrops. And what, but the, but the fact of the matter is, is what are you and I talking about? 31%. And so for me, I think that's an easy conversation to have. The hard conversation is, why aren't you rebounding more? So you're trying to tell me in a six foot three guard that you're the number one target to block out? We're missing half the shots. You, you, you're, you can't tell me that you don't want it more than them at 6'3 when no one's blocking you out. Run from the other end to this end. Go get it. That tells me you want to be in the game. That tells me you want more possessions. That tells me you want to play more. And so I just look at it like that. So I, I think it's all like my guys think that I'm psychologically twisting them. But I'm also I think what I'm doing is giving them the answers to the test and say, if you really want to be that guy, if you really want to be the guy then go do those four things. It's impossible for me to take you out of the game. And Matt, you know who ends up winning out of that deal? Me. If they go do all that stuff, we win. And then it looks like I know what I'm doing. And then it looks like the program knows what they're doing. And so I, I, I just made it so simple for me to talk about that it almost like they go home to mom and dad and they're like, well, coach just told me how I can play. It's going to be that easy. And, or, you know, we, and, and it, it's not. Because, you know, when you got big players, athletic players, and effort players, then it becomes, am I tough enough to stick with it? Am I tough enough to go out there and hurt? Am I tough enough to play through situations that are uncomfortable? And it, it really, 
Yes, the shooting thing is easy to me because everybody shoots. I mean, I, you can walk in my gym right now. There's five guys that are shooting, and no one's working on going and chasing a loose ball rebound. I mean, even in shooting drills, they walk after it, right? It, 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 even in, when you change baskets, everybody jogs to it, you know, and stuff like that. So it, I don't know. I have no idea why I don't focus on shooting. I just know the other four things seem to make mentally make more sense to me than anything else. So that's just probably my crazy way of doing it. Um, now, Coach, I'll tell you, th this is why um, I love doing this. And, you know, even after almost almost two years now, golly, that's crazy. Almost two years now, uh, I still love it. And I learn yeah. new things all the time. But that last, I mean, literally what you just talked about for the last five, ten minutes was just eye opening for I know you. Right. But now I really understand. Like I really understand what I've watched you go through in clinics, you know, why your teams play so hard, why you're able to be successful. And 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 it just I had like I just had so many light bulb moments right there. And all honestly too. That's it, probably my head. No. Nah. <laughs> it the blue light shot. No, it's yeah. uh it's it's it, it highlighted, it just highlighted some deficiencies. Um, I think we all have blind spots and we all like, we can't choose to focus on everything. Sure. Like it's really hard to do that, but I choose to focus on probably the lowest hanging fruit out there, <laughs> which is shooting. But how many times in games do I, am I frustrated? Not about the 44 three point attempts we had. I'm right. frustrated about our lack of rebounding. Right. Or lack of effort, maybe a high turnover count. And but you get what you emphasize. Sure. You get the types of effort plays and and wins and style of basketball that in to your own words makes sense. But man, I'll tell you that I thank you. Like that was super well, valuable. Yeah, and, and that's why I love doing these stuff. I never bat an eye when somebody asks to call because I, it, one, it gives me a chance to kind of talk. When you talk out loud, it makes you, am I crazy or does it make sense? And then you verbalize it. And we all spend our lives talking. But then I knew, I knew your deal. I mean, I know you love to shoot it and the game's going that way. And I, and I always like corrective criticism, you know, like maybe you would have said to me, well, coach, I mean, in order to rebound it, we got to shoot it. Uh, in, order to, in, order to pass, in order to pass, get good passes, you gotta have good shooters, or it's yeah. gonna be one on one. And so, those are things that I knew coming into this conversation that we're we, we have a way of, of blending this together and talking about it. And, and then, you know, I've listened to dozens of your podcasts and I take all those things and I listen as I'm walking and doing whatever. But I'll tell you, man, I, I, I as we all get older as coaches, probably our patient level becomes less and less because. We understand what it takes to work. We understand what it takes to win. And we don't have to overcomplicate things. But I tell you, where, where, where I stand at is we deal with so many different kids from so many different coaches, mentors, moms, dads, buddies, this guy, my AAU coach, my guy in the corner. <laughs> and so I have to do what? I've got to bring it all together in a short period of time. It could be eight months, two years, four years. And I've got to make it so simple that I get instantaneous results. And so it doesn't have to be all American results. It just has to be two steps forward, not three steps back. And so when I figured out a way to communicate this and it didn't happen overnight, but when I figured out a way to communicate it, I figured out a way that I know I can start it simple and I can make it more complex as every practice goes on, every game goes on, every day goes on, every year goes on. And so now I look at my seven, my, my fifth year senior who had a chance to break the school scoring record this year, but had some injuries and stuff like that. And he's, he couldn't guard anybody when he started and now he's better. And then he never rebounded, but then he led us in offensive rebounds. You know, it's all those different things. And like, so he started, instinctively talking about it. Like I just said, man, how come we're not doing the four things that hold this house together? All of a sudden we got one or we, I, I called it the flat tire this year. Every game we had one of the four things that was our flat tire, but they wanted to keep the car on the road. 
It doesn't work that way, man. You get a flat tire, that thing's either the side of the road or ditch. And so every game we were talking about, okay, we're obviously not in very good shape, so we got to address it. Or we're obviously not rebounding the ball. we got to address it. You all want to stay on the road, but you don't do the four things. And so I started building this in my head as a, as my program, as my identity. Is it, and, and, and as simple as it sounds, when I'm talking to a freshman and staring me in the eyes going, it, it really becomes simple. I mean, because yeah. if you just can do those four things, you should never come in my office and argue playing time. Matter of fact, if you do those four things, you won't ever come in my office. You'll be sitting, there, you'll be coaching the practice. Yep. You'll yep. be saying, hey, man, I rebound, you rebound. I pass the ball, you pass the ball. I run, you run. You know, I defend, we all defend. Those type of things. So I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, it's for me. Uh, I don't know if it ever really translates anywhere else. It's hard to do because you know how hard this game is and how much better these guys are getting, and how much bigger and faster and stronger and smarter. And they're training more. They're doing all this different stuff. So the game is so fast and athletic, and that's why it's the best game in the world. But to keep it simple is the only way I operate. As you can see, I mean, I, I can talk myself out of a room if you let me. I, I'm all over the place. But uh, that being said, I just try to keep it as simple as possible. No. Things. I, I think it's pretty clear. I think it's pretty clear what you're saying. And as a as a career uh, over my four years at, at Baylor, I averaged four and a half points. Uh, so uh, but I, I think I was the I would have loved to play for you because the four things that you're talking about, I had to bring those in order to oh. see the floor at all because I wasn't big enough or fast enough to score in the Big 12. And so, again, what you're saying, the player in me really, really gets it. I Here's a great um Great question for coaches. Maybe this week I get a chance is ask your players, what do you need to do to get on the floor to play? And and just leave it open-ended like that. Unfortunately, coach, I think if I asked my players right there, they would only talk about offense and they'd mainly talk about shooting. And even though, yeah, yeah, that's important, no doubt. I I don't know if anybody would say I need to rebound well. I mean, I need to run the floor hard. I, they would say something like fast basketball. They throw that term out, you know. Yeah. But running sure. a gun, we need to run a gun, you know. But yeah. uh, but man, I, I think that's a our players need to know what are the things that will get them on the floor. And golly, coach, the things that get them on the floor, it better actually lead us to winning. Well, that's the other thing. Like I, I'm not interested in anything other than. Uh, putting OW in the win column. And and so, and I think it's funny because the year we've had has really made me a better coach. Um, and I know my assistant feels the same way. Not only has it made me a better coach, but it's made him a better coach. And I will tell you that if one of my players walked in this locker room right now and I slid out of the picture and you asked them, they would say that verbatim. Like they have heard it over and over and over because of the year we've had. Uh, it, it never left a conversation, whether it was in practice, whether it was in post game, whether it was pre game. We just kept it so simple. And Matt, the problem is we weren't very good at it, and that's the hardest part. Like it just became factors in which we couldn't control. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is powered by Shoot Three Hundred and Sixty. The future of basketball has arrived in Dallas Fort Worth. Shoot Three Hundred and Sixty combines the latest sports technology with the fundamentals of basketball skill development. The result is a one-of-a-kind video game-like basketball program designed to improve your shooting, dribbling, and passing. Visit Shoot360DFW.com to learn more and register for your free one-hour workout evaluation. Shoot360, the future of basketball is here. I got to ask you, though, because you mentioned it early on about the injuries that you had. And this is, I mean, this is really, I, I need a little bit of help with this. As, as coaches... Do we we have a plan and we have a direction, maybe even like a, a height that we feel like this team can get to. But right. then when injuries happen and a major pieces, yeah. I mean, it's tough. Like you want to hold them to the same standards and still expect the same, like if excellence is a word that we use a lot, still the same standard of excellence, but knowing deep down, like what Tom Inman told me years ago, which is he said, Matt, we're jockeys. The best horses win. There's some right. truth to that. But I mean, great coaches like yourself can take a bad horse and make it a little bit better. But I, I what what do we do when 
there are some legit reasons why we're not performing at our level. How do we keep them moving forward without feeling like kind so, of what, you, what you've been talking about? I think that the the thing that when you were talking, I was trying to listen and, and correct myself, knowing that I needed to make a good, healthy statement rather than be negative. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what it brought out of me. It brought a personal side that we're all open to failure. We're mm. all open to not things going our way as planned. You know, we're all open to adjustment and figuring out ways to still do our job the best of our ability while honoring things and others around us. And so that was our thing all year long. Every time we showed up, every time the phone rang, every time we had a practice, we it got to a point where we were looking over our shoulders like, what next? Yeah. What's going to happen to us? And, and the thing that I admired most about this, kid, this team is we never had anybody quit. We never had anybody say, you know what? Hell with this. I can't do it anymore. It didn't mean that we got the result we wanted because this league is very hard to win in. But if you can go beat Whalen Baptist – and then, and then do these things that you did. You had pieces to the puzzle. Um, we reinvented ourselves a million times this year. But I will tell you that, again, going back to your four pillars or four things that you hold on to your program, it almost played true because at the end of the day, those things don't ever change in basketball. You can be 6'5", or seven foot, if you can't do those four things, then you're just six, five or seven foot. And so we we really went back to who our true character was all year long, on and off the court. It, it, and that's really kind of what this whole scenario provided us when, when we had got dealt these issues that we had zero control over. It really, it was God's way of saying, man, I'm going to get the best out of you, whether you want it or not. You're, you're either going to show up and do your job this year or you're not. And, mm -hmm. and so we had to, we had to kind of help each other through that whole scenario. And you and what you and I both know as well as anybody, if you want to be married, you'll work hard at it. If you want to be employed and actually be valued as an employer and not somebody that collects a paycheck, then you're going to work hard at it. I, I, I use the term this year, and there's nothing wrong with it, so I don't want to offend anybody. But at times, we were all minimum wage employees. You know, there were times where we were just doing just enough to get by. I say we because obviously there were probably minutes and hours that I probably didn't do my job to itself. Um, but those type of things, I think this the injuries, life stuff, this is what really you get your stripes as a coach and as a player to move forward. So the big thing is for me is this is a timestamp and, and I'm going to be able to look back on this in August and September and say, you talked about all this. Now are you going to do it? And, and I think that really resonates with anybody that cares enough and that wants to be successful. And I, you know, it's still hard for me to wrap my head around 21 years and 10 years or 11 years as a coach with a COVID year as a head coach. Uh, it's still hard to think that I'm still doing this with energy, you know, and with. Kind You're of not burnt shit. out yet. Yeah. <laughs> urgency. Like My guys get on me all the time. Like, how come you don't wear any of your rings? And I'm like, dude, because I didn't win them with you. I mean, I, they'd be kind of like flashing around your ex-girlfriend with your wife. I mean, it's kind of like, that don't make any sense. I mean, I, I'm trying to win these things with you. I'm trying to show you that I don't need that pass to get me to where I need to go. I need that urgency to do it now, you know. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, one of your coaches wear their rings with pride, and they should. I just choose not to, you know. I, 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 I love that. I love that yeah. uh, viewpoint of it. And I think I think you felt it this year, and, and, and so did I. Uh, there's There are times in sports where – or seasons where we get to define success differently. My right. senior year at Baylor, eight and 21 with six scholarship players, Coach Drew first year, we were ultra successful at eight and 21. This right. year, your team, my team, the fact that we didn't have kids that quit, they showed up right. and worked hard. They gave us our very, very best. It didn't go the way that we dreamt about it and wanted to go. But man, like you and I can still look back with fondness. I think that's a success because sure. a majority of coaches when are not regarded coaches, but when teams, 
when they face adversity like that, if the culture, if the standards and pillars aren't in place well enough, man, right. it can become a disaster. And, right. and you and I didn't experience that. Sure. It's good. I think I know the answer to this question based on your the, what you said with your four things. But yeah. there's, you know, there's a debate out there. It's uh, do you take players and fit them into a style that you love? And I've been on that side. Or do you take uh, the style? Is your style based on the players that you have? And where do you kind of fall in, in that debate? I have always tried to find kids that I want to coach and be around. And then if they possess great characteristics or qualities on the court, I'm always going to adjust to their strengths. So it's kind of, again, you know, we're a liberal arts school and we get away with some conversations probably that other schools are like, oh, don't say that. <laughs> I always joke around with my guys. We're, we're all dating. You can get out of this anytime you want. As can I. We're not married. We're not legally bound to anything. I'm going to honor your scholarship if you walk out of here right now. Because if you walk out of here now, it's better than, than sticking around and being miserable, right? And so I look at this like I'm always trying to earn their trust. I'm always trying to do a little bit more to show them that I'm the mature one and that I'm the one that's been here and done that and can get you to where your goals are wanting to go, right? But on the flip side of that, you have to coach what you're comfortable coaching. You have to do with things that you're that you know that you'll get the best out of those players. Like for instance, I call Coach G every year and say, "Help me with this one three one." Twenty eleven years as head coach, I still don't know how to coach one three one, but I, I, I'm okay with it. I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm not doing thirty possessions of it. I'm not doing thirty minutes of it. I'm doing one or two a game. Give me a tweak. Tell me how to teach it. Let's go. But when it comes to running transition, when it comes to making the extra pass, when it comes to going head hunting the ball and being in great shape, I'll go with anybody. You know, uh, we're going to try to do that. So, again, the players know that coming in. I might have a kid that's really good at pressuring the ball and can keep people in front of him defending, and that's his natural instinct, and I like that about him, where it might make me a little uncomfortable. But I have to play to his strengths, and so I, that's my humility. I have to stop and go, you know what? I'm going to do what's best for him and the team and us to get us those wins. And so I think there's a constant battling, uh, a balancing act in a lot of ways. I'm not a person that's ever going to sit there and say, it's my way or the highway. Now, we all have disciplines. We all have ways of doing things. Um, you know, there's non-negotiables. But at the end of the day, the playing side of it, I think as coaches, we're getting in a lot of trouble if we sit there and say, we're going to get these 17 to 22-year-old guys to adjust to us in the period of time in which we have and still be successful. If the, if you can do that, brother, you I don't think you should be coaching college basketball. I think you should be running our government. All right? I think you should be doing things that <laughs> <laughs> way more important because right now, at the end of the day, as far as I can know, there's 15 players and two coaches. Who's going to win? Wow. You know, and so we always have to adjust. I mean, every day of the week we adjust. I had a kid on our national championship team named Nigel Young. He came in from UI Chicago, you know, University of Illinois, Chicago. He transferred in and he was convinced he could shoot threes, convinced he could shoot threes. His teammates were going to him, Nigel, stop shooting threes. I kept telling him, Nigel, I'm just telling you, brother, you, you're one of 12 in practice. I get it. And he would convince me and say, well, just give me more opportunity to rebound the ball. I'm like, but Nigel, if you don't rebound, it's a turnover. And at the end of the day, so I, I used to try, I let him spend five minutes a day in practice shooting threes. And that was all he needed. I never let him shoot threes in the game because he knew it was a turnover and it was going to limit an offensive rebound or something that effect for himself. So he never shot it. And that team ended up winning the national championship, not because of him, but because of my ability to sit there and go, okay, how do I give him a little? Wow. without giving them a lot, you know? And so I had to learn that, man. It wasn't, I mean, it might've been God's way of saying, okay, keep this kid intact. Or it might've been my selfish way of saying, I've got to give him something because if I have to waste, or what I said, waste five minutes in practice, let him shoot threes, it wasn't a waste. We ended up winning because of it. So I think there, we all as coaches have to find a, a real balance there of system versus 
success or what's your core characteristics versus what you're willing to give up to get, you know, to get something. And, and maybe, maybe I'm an outlier here. I don't know. Uh, I just only know the way that I can operate. I know there's non-negotiables, but I do know that these players possess a whole lot of talent sometimes that we hold back if we don't give them a chance to show it, you know, whether hey. it's leadership, whether it's basketball, whether it's defense, offense, you know, there's some guys that can handle three or four dribbles. There's other guys that don't need to dribble once. And so we have to kind of play into that. So, uh, again, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you're, uh, you, you kind of said, are you an outlier? I, I think a lot of the best coaches out there think like you take the players and help them to be successful on the floor. And, and then the willingness for you to adapt and do things a little bit differently if that's what they need. Um, I wonder, and I think I think it's because I've been on this part of it, the idea of having a system that you run that other people like or can emulate. I wonder how much of arrogance starts to play a part of that. Like I am I am known for this, so I have to continue to do this. Right. And I think I've fallen I, I, into I would that say trap. It plays a big part. I mean. Just because I tell you I don't run a certain offense doesn't mean that I don't have some arrogance about what we do. I mean, I think we all have arrogance about us because that's what separates us from being average Joes, I guess we should say. I mean, you know, we all have to be confident in what we do. I mean, it doesn't mean we sit there and pound our chest, but, I mean, we, we all have to sell our programs. We all have to sell our visions every day. But with sales has to come with some real hard data or some facts yeah. or some you know, and so I think we walk that fine line. You know, I I wish I could have it was shoot 44 threes a game and shoot 40 percent of them. But at the end of the day, that's not who we get to recruit, man. You know, <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. Who, we might have one, but we don't have seven. And, yeah. and that one has to be able to really put it in the hole. And so we look at it that way, you know, and, and also, too, man, there's nothing more humbling than. I know I coach at Texas Wesleyan. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I, I've never met a kid that grew up with a Texas Wesleyan pennant on his wall. I, there ain't one. Name one. If you win it, you win the prize. And, and 21 years of this, I've never met one kid that had a Texas Wesleyan pennant on his wall. So my job as an egotistical coach, wink, wink, right, is that I want you to grow, to now leave this place knowing that this was the best experience of your life. This is the best choice I made. These are the things that I should have done my whole life, and I'm glad that I learned it here. That's where my ego gets involved. That's where I, I think that we can do it, and I pride myself in trying to do it relentlessly, is that I, I'm very aware that we're probably not anyone's first choice. And I think it's safe to say this is going to go out nationally, that I wasn't my wife's first choice. So it's okay, you know, but <laughs> damn it. I'm a good husband. I'm a good father. I work hard at it. I'm loyal. You know, I'm going to go home tonight and cook dinner and rebound for my son and give my wife a hug as she stiff arms me out of the kitchen. You know, it's all that stuff, but it's the same situation here. Like, I get it. You wanted to be at Texas. You wanted to be at TCU. But what are you going to do here? Like, what are you going to I mean, If you're worth your salt, then what are you going to do here, man? And that's, that's where this thing kind of always adjusts, right? We always play the yeah. adjustment. And you nailed it, that arrogance and confidence. I think right. the arrogance stops you from making the adjustments that you need to for the for your players and for your team. The confidence right. part allows you to believe and sell it to your players, believe in what you're doing, yeah. but still have the ability, the humility to make the adjustments, to let that guy shoot for five minutes even though in your heart you're like, this doesn't help uh, us, but didn't the, have to worry the, about replacing the nets on that kid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you saved some money uh the for yeah. from the program. Yeah. Uh, Working on rebounds today, guys. So we're all right, go ahead. You've talked a lot about your family, and it's been that's been a blast just getting to learn more about that side of your life. Because I mainly have, our interactions have really just been around basketball. Right. How do you balance coaching and family life it's been it's been the biggest challenge of my life um thus, thus far especially as i get older and my kids get older you know when they were younger and they were in a crib or they were in a high chair or something 
they never knew any different, right? But now they have awareness and needs and then they start paying attention to dad's body language. And then they see dad, you know, temperature rising. So my daughter, I've got this vein that runs through the side of my head and she comes to the games. And Matt, I will tell you this, this year, she would sit on the score table and she would hand me the scoreboard, only in the NAI, man. This is beautiful, right? Yeah. So she would hand me the 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 dry erase board and look at me with these big blue eyes. And at that point, I knew, calm down, man. It's not the end of the world. And so it, it's a, it, you talk about evolution. It, it's something that I pay attention to every day because, you know, if I don't have balance, then I don't have perspective because – uh, what am I doing? I mean, it, I could win another national championship here, Matt, and I'm going to tell you right now, my paycheck won't get any more. Uh, it, it just won't. That's the world we live in. It's, it, in small college athletics, it's not like some some person's going to go, oh, yeah, let's give this dude a $40,000 raise. It doesn't happen. I mean, we, and, and I, I'm aware of that, but I'm also okay with that because I drove here today. I didn't get dropped off. I chose to come here. So uh, in, in my life, I have to find balance because – I love basketball, but I don't love it that much. I love my family. Uh, I love Man. my life. I love my opportunity to to go home at night and, and possibly be the guy that they need me to be, you know? And so where did I learn that? Why did it resonate with me? I have no clue. I, I didn't have this moment of life. That we're at. My parents are still married 54 years later. How blessed am I, right? My in-laws are married 56 later, wow. years later. How, how blessed am I? You know, and so I've got four kids that, that are at home and not one in a hospital, one doing this, doing that. How blessed am I? So you talk about being hypocritical. That's something that I, I choose every day to try to not be is that I've got to have balance because I owe it to them, right? I mean, they didn't do anything wrong for me to go home and be a, a turd. Now, that, um, am I perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, there are days that I walk in, I slam my phone down and like catching it right away. But I do also have a very strong wife and she's very aware and she'll point me out and say, not tonight, bud. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how mean you look, but it ain't happening in here. And so those type of things work out well. You know, my kids are a valuable part of my life and program here. So there's times where they come up here and like, Dad, you know, can you rebound for me? Or can you just sit in the office and play school with me? Or, you know, whatever it might be. And so those things are all a kind of balance. And, and it also, Matt, who are you kidding? This level allows us to have balance, right? I'm not recruiting nationally 365 days a year. Could I coach at that level? I don't know. It doesn't, it, I haven't been, I haven't had to show it. So balance comes with this level. Uh, and I'm going to choose to take that opportunity rather than have it taken away from me. Um, so, you know, I think it also deals with the circumstances. I think, I hope I'm smart enough to know my surroundings, right? And so this job allows me balance. This job allows me awareness. This job allows me to go home at night to my kids rather than be on the road recruiting or traveling 10 days at a time. So those are all things that I chose. Um, you know, maybe it chose me. I don't know. I just look at it like I just have to, I have to take advantage of the opportunities that are given me. Um, and that is, I chose to be married. I, I, I really try hard and choose to be a great father. That remains to be seen, but, um, this, this level in this school is also allows me to, to have that balance. And so I'm, I, I take advantage of it, man. I don't, I don't lose one second. I hope of, of knowing that there's days I'm not perfect, but there's also days that, um, I'm so glad that I have this opportunity to have balance rather than, you know, we all know those coaches out there that would just love to hang around the lobby of a hotel instead of being home with their wife and kids. And so that's a, that's a choice they make. And this is a choice I make. So. I love that you keep, you keep using that word um, choice or choose. We, we want our players to choose to, like you said, even back to your culture piece, choose to right. be there. Like we're not forcing you. I love the dating right. analogy and all of that. I, it seems to me like you have chosen just to be faithful in that place that where where God has you, and, he, and right. He's had you there for 21 years. Yeah. Let, let me ask you because I I'm 10 years at faith, and I feel that way. I'm I'm not. I know that there are bigger places in high school basketball than Grapevine Faith Christian School. And I know how few of the people out there really care about, uh, you know, what we're doing. Right. Um, but I'm going to do my very, very best. And I love it here. Let me, my question is, is 
Did you always feel that way? Or was there a time in your life, your coaching career, where you had a hunger or a desire maybe for that that life like you just talked about, yeah. but then family kids came along and you were able to have that click moment? Yeah, I I uh I think every time, every year about this time, that creeps in your life because you know, once August starts, I mean, obviously no one leaves jobs or does anything, but you always, I, I, I'm, I'm constantly searching for challenges, right? Like, can I do this? Can I do the next thing? Can I do this? Can we regroup? Can we do all these different things? And, uh, I mean, Matt, tomorrow a opportunity might present itself to me and it might be so lucrative that I can't turn it down. I yeah. mean, now, comes about my family and not about me anymore, you know? And so those are situations that we fight daily, right? As men, as fathers, we're sitting here going, okay, can, are we making enough money? Are we securing some future things for our kids that we don't see right now, right? And so I don't know. It's I don't think I ever had an epiphany of some sort that says, this is what it's going to be for me. I, I've just always been very loyal in the sense of, it would be very hard for me to leave um, because of the relationships I have. I think that my stick here, that my talking and moving and personality, I'd have to start all this over again. Man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, it, it might work and it might not, but this is kind of a piece of my identity. Now, when I yeah. walk the halls, I see the pictures, I, I have the relationships, I have former players come back. I have, this and that and you know those guys that bounce from job to job and do all these different things man it in my opinion that's got to be just exhausting right uh i hope this place kind of speaks for itself at times like maybe our reputation precedes us a little bit and and so i look at it like it makes my job a little bit easier because i am so loyal you know and because i'm so prideful in this place and heck i mean we're in fort worth you know, I'm not in the middle of Oklahoma. None of my friends there I hope are offended, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't mind so much mind having a ton of places to eat and, <laughs> and great golf courses and great weather and, you know, facilities in which we can get in and out of town. So my wife's got a great job. So, I, yeah, there are times that I probably look back at 46 years old and say, I wish I would have done this and this to maybe put myself on a different track. But Matt, who's to say I would have this great wife and kids and yeah. have this conversation with you? I could be some knuckleheads that just talks around hotel rooms uh, and, and lobbies this weekend saying, I wish I could have done this and that when it's in essence, I've, I've kind of done it, you know, and that's how I feel. And so I'm pretty comfortable with that. Uh, but thankfully, I've made choices that have allowed me to do that. Um I know the last question you were going to ask me is there anything I've done differently? Yeah, I feel and, like you, let's just go right into that. That's yeah, great. Yeah. And really, when I thought of that question, I think I, I wish I would have done a better job putting myself out there. Um, I, I didn't. I was always really secure in my faith and my, my place here. And like, you know, Coach G always used to say to me, you do a terrible job of networking or of selling yourself. Marketing. Like, yeah. Social media, <laughs> marketing. And I'm like, Matt. Dude, I, I got enough problems. I don't need anybody questioning me. Like, I don't, I'm terrible at Twitter. I'm terrible at Instagram. Like, I have, I, I don't want to make it about me. I, I want to make it about us. And sometimes it's super important. Like, this week I tweeted out, or last week I tweeted out the importance of this story of my my uh, my assistant coach in, in his fight with terminal cancer. I think it's important that people are aware of what he's doing on a day-to-day -day basis to get here to help these young men. So to me, that's that's promotion. That's newsworthy. Whereas, yeah, I, I'm not going to sit here and make these what are they graphics of me cheering on this and that ah, shit, man. I, <laughs> I you talk about uncomfortable, brother. I, I'll start sweating. And I mean, look how awkward and bad built I am. Why do I need to put that on some sort of whatever? Beat? So. I, so, yeah, I, if, if I had to do it all over again, I would have found maybe that common ground of, of self-promotion or uh, salesmanship personally. I don't have a problem talking to you about this program, yeah. what it's all about. 
my faith and this and that. I, that. Those are all stuff that I'm very confident in. But to sit there and sit there and go, hey, I can do this, I can do that, I'm this, I'm that. Gosh, I'm terribly uncomfortable about it. I, I just don't. I'm, I just don't like it. And uh, and so that would be something that I think is is tremendously valuable right now because these kids buy into that. Uh, these young guys really look at social media and say, this is pretty confident. This is that, this is cool. This is, you know, that, and, and look at, I, if you, you know, don't want to be here and listen to this crap and, and, and really look yourself in the mirror, uh, and challenge yourself to be better than hell yeah, I'm not going to get the best out of you anyway. And you're probably not going to make me any better anyway. So it's kind of, you know, like you used to, people used to argue like, why would anybody coach Bob Knight? or go to Bob Knight to be coached. Well, like you chose to go there. You knew what he was before you got there. Why are you arguing that now? It's not like yeah. you didn't know he was going to be hard on you or whoever, right? And yeah. So these conversations are are things that we all probably need to adjust to. But I, I – in the world in which we're living, podcasts and social media and all these different things, there's probably something that I could probably do a little bit better to help this program – as far as I guess pitching myself out there a little bit more because I am a, regardless of what uh, how I feel about saying this, I guess I am a big part of this program. And so not physically, but uh, no, it's your pretty big deal. You're a pretty yeah. big deal. And I appreciate yeah. the humility there. And thank you for sharing. Uh, I mean, everything that you just did. Uh, I struggle. I struggle with the two. I know it sounds weird to say that because if you're watching it, I have a yeah. shameless plug of of the book oh, right there. Book. And, no. But but the whole thing is like I, I know I do this podcast, but honestly, man, like it started because I was talking to a a a, a lady, a girls coach in Rockwall uh, during COVID. We were doing a Zoom. She wanted to talk about shooting, and somehow it got around to where. She talked about a culture thing that she does with her team, how she takes them out to a cabin. At first in my head, I was like, well, that's not special. I mean, everybody, a lot of people do trips. And then she started to talk about some questions that she had, that she asked her team and what it did. And I thought, I just told her, I was like, coach, that's that's awesome. And I started to think about how many coaches out there are, are out there that do great things that I can learn from. But, sure. you know, if you don't win state, if you don't win a national championship, you're not getting invited to speak at TABC. And that's, right. or, you know, and that's about it. And and so that was the whole motivation. The cringy part of me with all of this. Uh, see, I, I like to sit here and just ask you questions. Yeah, I don't. I so there's a few times where people turned around and back at me and it catches me off guard because yeah. that's not really what I'm doing here. Right. But I had a Chris Hill, a Jesuit say that I had the best least known podcast out there no, because I, I, well, but I, I mean that I just, I mean that because I, I, I struggle with ways like you to, uh, I'm happy to do the grapevine faith basketball a social media account because right. that's me promoting the the guys sure. uh my own oh i can't stand it and but you know what like i was thinking about what you said is you're one of the few guys that doesn't do that that actually it's that kind of makes you cool like it, you're different you're not you're doing different all. than for thinking i'm cool because <laughs> i don't think but I'm isn't that cool. what I think it, I'm, I'm way behind well coach but see now everybody's doing it yeah. And and there's going to be there's going to come a time where I actually think it's already where uh, Kevin Durant said this is back when I kind of liked him. He said, um, uh, man, uh, humble is cool. Uh, humble is in like something like right. cocky is out. Humble is in arrogance out. Humble is in something like that. And I can't I think I butchered. That, do you know, but, do you know, Brendan, sir, that does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, coaching you. Coaching you. Right. So. We're on the bus back from the national championship. And again, this isn't a plug of any sort, but um, he calls me up and I'm like, what? And I knew him from David Patrick. So I knew the name, whatever. And he says, I'm going to ask you to do this coaching you deal. And I mean, I don't know if you remember the, the line up there. And then you got me and I'm thinking this guy used me particularly so everybody could get up and get a drink, go to the bathroom, get a snack, run out to have I'm right coffee. during lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> and then come back and they can get Jamie Dixon right after me. And I'm thinking, this guy's genius, man. I, he plugs me in there so everybody can get up and go to the bathroom. I mean, that was my first thought. 
like, and, and I shouldn't be thinking that way. You know, I mean, I, it, we all have our strengths. We all have our platforms to stand on it or God wouldn't have put us in these shoes. You know, yeah. if we wanted to be work a discount tire, no offense, but if we wanted to change tires all day, then that's what sure. we would be. Uh, but we're not. And so I think that we all have a, a light to shine a little bit. And some of us are better at others, but, uh, and I, I'm thankful that you asked me, I, I've listened to a dozen of these things and, and every once in a while I skip over it because I forget to check Twitter or something and, and I find that's it. That's okay, coach. That's okay. <laughs> no, but it, your, your approach is so good because it's humble and it's direct and it's basketball with some faith in there and it's sprinkled all over directions and you don't, you don't uh, discriminate like most podcasts want to go after these big tweet or click guys, you know, and then obviously when I saw you had Clint on there, I was like, he's going to get anybody on this thing. <laughs> if he got that dude on there, but uh, you know, what's funny is some yeah, I was of my... only hoping Clint had a tie on, you know, and slicked his hair over and all that stuff, but no, he's the best. The Jamoti podcast is powered by sideline interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. Well, Coach, the uh, we've been going on for almost uh, uh, an hour and a half, so thank you so much for your time. But yeah. I, I can't. I got to get the 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 speed round in because i know you and a lot of co- me and matt garnett know you well but we're gonna know you even better after this you ready okay. fair enough favorite ice cream flavor uh cookies and cream favorite shooter of all time larry bird oh yeah best basketball movie of all time white man can't jump Thank you. Like that's a yeah, it's a great movie. I, no, hardly anybody says that. That's yeah. good. Uh, texting or talking? Texting. For high school, shot clock or no shot clock? Shot clock. That's right. Um, favorite holiday? Um, because of family, I'm gonna say Christmas, but internally, I'm gonna say St. Patrick's Day because I'm an Irish kid. Nice. Nice. Uh, this is a new one. Up three on defense. Seven seconds wow. left. Yeah. Wow. 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 Okay. Wow. All right. I wasn't going to let you finish the statement. You did it. I was you, telling my kids the other night the game. Foul. And that damn they, they they switched that handoff perfectly and didn't even get a shot off. I was like, oh my goodness. Yep. Wow. Yep. Um, in basketball, who's the goat? It is not LeBron. So we can go any direction you want with that, but it's not LeBron. Uh, we can we can say Will Chamberlain, we can go Bill Russell, we can do Michael Jordan, but it ain't LeBron. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to lean in. Uh, what's what's keeping you back from Team LeBron? Uh, I. I'll tell you. I I'll tell you. Think that, I just don't think that he has, in my opinion, the rules have changed. The game is different. There's players that take plays off, nights off. Yeah. The, the game is different. Like, I don't know. And plus, I'm a kid of the 90s, man. What do you want me to do? Yeah. I, I, we, we watched Jordan in his prime. Yeah, like that's no just, way, that's like, tough. you know, what's his name, the talking head on TV? I mean, I don't think anybody fears LeBron James. Like, we grew up where Michael Jordan had dudes, like, running out the tunnel the wrong Just direction. watch Last Dance, I, man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, like, he had his teammates doing that. He had executives scared of him, all because of what? Not because he was a bully. It's because he just wanted to win. I mean, he did whatever it took to win. And and you just don't sense that with LeBron. And and if if you're going to thin slice things, and it's going to become about it, like that thin of a margin, that's all I see. I mean, is LeBron LeBron in the conversation? Hell, that's that's it. Like, it's the conversation. So, I mean, younger kids, older guy, whatever. I I don't think we should ever really – there's never going to be a pedestal. I mean, no, no one's going to ever win the argument. It's always going to be debatable. So yeah. I yeah. walk in 
our locker room a hundred times this year and say, guys, you're wasting your time. I'm dumber for listening to this. Let's go to practice. Let's go to class. <laughs> it's yeah. like Billy Madison. We yeah. are all now dumber. <laughs> yeah. No one's winning this conversation. You know, it's kind of like you uh, just move on. So I've got a few more favorite yeah. place to travel. Uh, anywhere there's a beach. Nice. I love the beach. Yep. Or I mean, a golf course. Beach or uh, golf you course. lost me there. You lost me there. But golf course or beach, I'm there. Uh, favorite mute, favorite music genre Ooh, uh i'm a music guy too uh probably alternative rock yeah, like late or 90s and that yeah, like kind of like, oh, yeah. like like the 90s up uh maybe just a hair past nirvana and all that but yeah just starting to kind of move into like the incubuses of the world. Lincoln Park back Lincoln in the day. Park. Let's go. You know, the okay. Well, age, all right. You know, yeah. This is, you know, this music stuff nowadays, you don't understand a damn thing you're saying. So it's just, yeah. Anyway. I got to ask you, what about uh, Nickelback? Do you, do you enjoy Not a Nickelback it? guy. <laughs> Not a Nickelback guy. No. That's fair. Last and, one. Okay. Uh, last one. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? I'm probably three now. Not a big coffee guy. My wife introduced me to it. Uh, in cold weather, I'm a coffee guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm a massive sweater. Like, I sweat all the time. So, coffee does nothing but raises my temperature. My wife thinks I'm crazy because I'll, wear, I'll, I'll, I'll walk around in shorts and a t-shirt all year long. Like, I wear shorts all year long. I can't. So, coffee's good, but too much of it, I'm, uh, my temperature's already hot. So, but I, I will drink some coffee. Three, three is probably my max. I don't need a whole lot to get going, as you can see. So, <laughs> Coach, I'll tell you, man, uh, this was so enjoyable for me. Uh, one, I, I, I love just getting to laugh this much with with another coach, and, and, and for there to be so many lighthearted moments. But then, also, uh, again, knowing you, uh, and well, you know what? I thought I knew you. Like, yeah. honestly, and I mean that in a good way. Like, I thought I knew the the tough side of you and the hard-nosed coach and stuff. But the to hear more about your culture and the way that you you work with your your players and the environment that you've created and the things that you've learned, and golly, man, like, I just got so much out of this. So I appreciate really, it. Really, th- really appreciate you. Well, thank you. I, I'm glad I did it. And, and don't hesitate. If you need me to make a cameo, holler at me, even if it's a – you know, get your lighting right on your podcast or something. So <laughs> hey, real quick, if 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 coaches uh, want to follow up or, or dive deeper on anything, how how can they reach out to you? How can they uh, find all you? My information's online, and then obviously uh, my cell phone is eight one seven nine six six three one six zero. And then uh, I know I do have those social media outlets, but <laughs> you have that too. So I'll let you do that. That's right. Uh, but no, I, and our practices are always open. Our gyms are always open. Anytime you want to come and just hang out, talk basketball, I love it. I mean, I, I tend to learn more from, from others than, than myself. So, and, uh, and, uh, and again, we're in downtown Fort Worth. So, man, we're right here. Yeah. Man, Coach, thank you so much for your friendship, one, and then yeah. and for giving up your time today. This was huge. All right. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti Podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.